Hello class, welcome to the final segment of lecture 19. And in this final segment, we are going to talk about something called frontogenesis and frontolysis and take a look at some of the mathematics behind fronts, which kind of relates to these two concepts. So with that, let's go ahead and dive right into it. So first off, we'll start with the definition of frontogenesis. Uh, frontogenesis refers to any sort of process that would tend to create or intensify a front. And usually by intensify front, we mean intensify the thermal gradient that is the front itself. So if we intensify the thermal gradient of a front, then we say that we then intensify the front. But this can also refer to the process of creating a front from maybe there was nothing to begin with. Maybe there was no temperature gradient there to begin with, but some sort of physical process creates a temperature gradient, which would then result in the creation of a front. And usually anything, if you've got a front already in place, then anything that heats the warm side of the front or cool, and or cools the cold side of the front results in strengthening of the front itself. And this is in contrast to frontolysis, which is the process of weakening or even uh, going so far as to eliminate a thermal gradient. And uh, so again, frontogenesis is the process of creating or intensifying a front. Frontolysis is a process of weakening, weakening or even destroying a front. And unlike frontogenesis, when you look at frontolysis, in general, anything that cools the warm side and or heats the cold side of the front will tend to weaken the front. So again, most of the fronts that we looked at are, fr are boundaries that separate warm and cold air. So if the warm side of the front is getting warmer and or the cold side of the front is getting colder, then the front is intensifying because the thermal gradient is intensifying. And if the by contrast, if the warm side of the front is getting colder and the cold side of the front is getting warmer, then you're going to be weakening that thermal gradient and also weakening the front in the process. So that's what we mean by frontogenesis and frontolysis. And if we want to get into the mathematics of this, which we definitely do, we need to derive some sort of expression for the change in temperature gradient in time. And here we're going to be using potential temperature gradient so that we can properly quantify this on, say, also an upper air front as well. Even though mostly what we're going to be focusing on is surface fronts, but we also need an equation that will also work for us in upper air fronts. And the best way to accomplish that is to use potential temperature instead of actual air temperature. So uh, this is how things are going to start. And we also uh, we're concerned ourselves with the horizontal temperature gradient. Now you might be wondering, where's the y component in this? And we're going to be doing sort of a natural coordinate assumption or simplification to our front and justice equation where we're only going to be looking at the change along one axis. We're going to align our coordinate system so that's along one axis so that we can only focus on uh, or so that we can drastically simplify down some of the math here. And in this case, we're going to assume that the x-axis is aligned with aligned uh, perpendicular to the temperature gradient vector or pointing in the same direction as the isotherm. So just a bit of a caveat slash assumption that you want to keep in mind with this equation, we're assuming that our x-axis of our Cartesian grid is pointing in the same direction as the isotherms, which is also pointing perpendicular to the temperature gradient vector. And we want to look at how that component, how that temperature gradient, that horizontal temperature gradient changes with time. And uh, that's where this other term, this uh, capital F sub R, comes in place to signify frontogenesis. Sometimes you'll also see frontogenesis, uh, the symbol for that, as being a capital script F or a capital cursive F. But here I'm going to use S sub R uh, because that's just a personal preference of mine. But you'll also see this written as a capital cursive F as well. And to start... So here we've got an equation for how something evolves with time, but something that we need to do to get something more meaningful is we have to first swap the order of differentiation here. So here I'm taking the time derivative of uh, the x derivative of potential temperature, but to uh, in order to get somewhere with this equation, we actually need to reverse the order of differenti differentiation so that we take the x derivative of the time derivative of potential temperature. And mathematically, that would be represented by this. So derivative of the derivative with respect to x of d theta dt. And now you might be wondering, OK, how does that exactly help us? And if you remember back to lecture one, the definition of Eulerian Lagrangian reference frames, so you may remember an equation that looks something like this. So total derivative of some physical quantity with time is equal to the local derivative plus advection. And if we take that term and rearrange it a little bit so that we solve for this Eulerian partial derivative, which is what we're trying to get, which is what we're uh, going to substitute in for here, we solve for the Eulerian term, we get this. We get partial theta partial t is equal to d theta dt minus the advection term, which is equal to uh, d theta dt minus all that stuff, u d theta dx minus v d theta dy minus w d theta dz. And then what we can do is we can take this quantity d theta dt and plug it into this 
equation up here for frontogenesis to get an equation that looks like this. So time derivative of frontogenesis is equal to d dx of that entire mess. And when you go to apply that derivative operator to every term, you're going to get an even bigger mess because you're going to have uh, some product rules to worry about in here, but we're going to make some uh, simplifications slash approximations to sort of get a better idea of what's actually going on here. So again, when we take all the lovely derivatives, we get this giant, lovely mathematical mesh of terms and derivatives. And uh, something that we can do is we can assume that the second order terms are small enough that they can be neglected. And this is a very common assumption, actually, in the atmosphere. A lot of times we don't like to worry about anything uh, more than a first order derivative. Anything that's a second order derivative or a higher order than that is usually something that we not like to collect. And usually uh, that is a valid assumption, uh, to, but on some situations it might not be. But for most large scale weather phenomena like fronts or mesoscale or synoptic scale phenomena, usually this is a valid assumption. So we can get rid of that, get rid of those terms, and get an end result that looks something like this. So the front of genesis is equal to time derivative of x times d theta dt minus d theta dx du dx minus d theta dy dv dx and then minus d theta dz dw dx. So now you might be wondering, okay, how does this actually play into the atmosphere? And we're going to take a look at that, but I'm going to go ahead and define physically what these terms actually represent. This first term represents a differential diabetic term. So, and we'll see illustrations of what we mean by this a little bit later on. This term is often referred to as the confluence term, and this actually takes into account the, uh, say, a deformation flow pattern. So back in lecture nine, we introduced some kinematic flow patterns, one of which was a deformation pattern, and we said deformation patterns are important for the formation of fronts. And it turns out that this confluence term here basically represents a deformation pattern, the confirmation of a deformation flow pattern to the intensifying or even weakening of a front. And this third term over here, d theta dy dv dx, that is the horizontal shearing term. And this last term at the end is the vertical tilting term. But really, these two terms physically are pretty much the same thing. I should also point out that in this equation, we've neglected adiabatic effects, so we don't account for the possibility of rising air cooling as it goes up and then sinking air warming as it comes down. We're primarily focused mainly on the dynamics of this. We're not so much worried about the thermodynamics just yet. That'll be something you'll worry about in some later coursework. But it turns out that this horizontal shearing term and this tilting term are pretty much the exact same thing. It's just you're looking at two different axes in the Cartesian coordinate system. So in this horizontal shearing term, you're looking at the x and y axis. And this tilting term, this uh, vertical term, you're looking in the x and z axis. But they pretty much are the exact same process other than uh, that subtle difference. But let's take a look at what this might physically represent in the atmosphere. So let's take a look at the differential diabetic term. So Let's consider we have cloudy skies on the cold side, and here these uh, red dashed lines are representing isotherms or lines of constant temperature. So let's say I've got cold side over here, warm side over here, and I've got cloudiness over the cold side of the front, and I've got nice sunny skies. So that would tend to indicate that we've got, the, there's not as much warming taking place on the cold side, but this clear skies on the warm side is being subjected to continuous sunlight. And of course, radiation is a diabetic effect. It's not uh, something that's necessarily conserved, something that can change the change the potential temperature of, a, of an air parcel. Again, one of the reasons why we use potential temperature instead of regular temperature. But uh, if we subject the warm side to strong heating from the sun, then the warm side will be getting warmer. Cold side maybe gets a little warmer, but not as much. But this is an example of how the differential diabetic term can result in a front intensifying. If you've got clear skies over the warm side of the front, the warm side is going to be getting warmer. And if you've got uh, cloudy skies or even rain occurring on the cold side of the front, then you're going to be having the cold side getting colder, and that's going to intensify the front. And by convention here, this frontogenesis term, if that's positive, then that indicates the process of frontogenesis taking place at the front intensifying. If this were negative, if this entire term were negative, then we would have frontolysis. In fact, let's go ahead and take a look at that if we swap things around a little bit. So let's put the cloudy and rainy skies over the warm side of the front and the clear skies over the cold side. So again, this is going to, uh, the, the, the rain in the clouds is going to result in a cooling effect, but here this cooling effect is taking place on the warm side of the front and the heating from the sun is now taking place on the cold side of the front. So here we have a case of the cold side getting warmer and the warm side getting colder, which is going to tend to weaken the thermal gradient, which is going to result in frontolysis, which 
mathematic a mathematical conv convention of this term. If this term is negative, that means we have frontalysis or awakening front. And if this entire term is positive, then we have frontogenesis, which indicates an intensification of the front. Now let's take a look at the confluence term. So in the case of the confluence term, here we have uh, a nice... So if you look at this wind pattern, you see that the wind pattern wants to pack these isotherms tighter together. And you may remember from the definition of temperature gradient or gradient operator itself, if the distance between some, say, uh, some lines of constant value, if the distance between those two lines gets smaller, then your gradient is going to intensify. And you can see how the wind pattern here wants to compress these isotherms. It wants to bring the isotherms closer together, and that would in turn give us a stronger temperature gradient. So in this case, our confluence term, we have winds converging, and the process of those winds converging are bringing these isotherms closer together, which is resulting in frontogenesis. And if you want to, you can work through the mathematics to verify that the signs do work out. So if you go in the positive x direction, you're going towards warmer air, so d theta dx is positive, and you've got a convergent flow pattern, which means du dx is negative, which means if you look at just this term, that entire term is positive, which is in fact frontogenesis. And if we flip things around, if we put a divergent flow pattern, keep the temperature gradient the same, but put a divergent flow pattern, here we've got a flow pattern that wants to pull the isotherms apart, which is going to weaken the temperature gradient, which is therefore going to result in weakening of the frontal boundary. Frontal boundary. So that's a look at how the confluence term can either result in frontogenesis or result in frontolysis. And if we want to look at the tilting term, the vertical term, so I'm going to skip the horizontal shearing term, but I actually really haven't skipped it. It's just, you're actually going to see in a few minutes where I uh, show you the horizontal shearing term, you, you're going to see the exact same diagram. It's just going to be on two different axes. So here I'm looking in the positive x direction and the positive z direction, or the x, or a cross section of the x axis and the z axis. And if you look at how, if you, if you can imagine, say, like a horizontal circulation here, you can see you have, uh, if you look at, if you imagine the, say, a wind pattern that goes something like this, you see a wind pattern that is trying to pack these isotherms tighter together, which will tend to indicate uh, frontalis, uh, excuse me, frontogenesis. So if you can imagine, say, some sort of circulation taking place here, you would tend to have packing of the isotherms. Uh, both at the bottom and at the top, which would tend to result in the intensification of a front. And sometimes this, a lot of times in the real atmosphere, this circulation is not as pretty, but this is just an overly idealized sort of conceptual model to sort of illustrate how exactly this process works. So again, we're bringing warmer air closer to colder air, colder air closer to warmer air, which means we're intensifying the thermal gradient, which means we're intensifying the front. And the opposite case, here we're going to be bringing colder air towards warmer air and warmer air towards colder air. And if you can imagine, say, a circulation here, you can also imagine how uh, this is trying to pull some isotherms apart or actually trying to bring the colder air to the warmer air and the warmer air to the colder air, and this is going to result in frontolysis. And the horizontal shearing term is actually the exact same picture, it's just in the x and y direction instead of the x and z direction. So it's the same exact process for the horizontal shearing term, except here you're looking at the horizontal plane as opposed to, say, a vertical plane, or in the vertical direction. But it's the same exact idea. Warmer air going towards colder air, colder air going towards warmer air. So you have warmer air going towards colder air, colder air going towards warmer air up here. So that would give you frontogenesis. And then the opposite, here you're trying to pull the isotherms farther apart, bringing uh, colder air over to the warm side and warmer air over to the cold side, which is going to weaken the frontal, uh, the frontal boundary. So that's going to do it for lecture 19 and this lecture on fronts. And uh, with that, I will see you all in the next lecture.